All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, I think this is the last talk in the room for the day, so thanks for sticking around for me. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the live migration of Linux containers, which is, I think, a little bit different speed than the last few talks I've heard um, in this room today. Uh, in particular, there, there, there was one about the cloud anti-patterns, and he asked people to define what a container was, and he gave a very, a very accurate, but I think a very user-facing definition of the uh, container, where it was the application and some metadata that... Uh, define how it's going to behave. And the, the view here that, um, well, I guess I could, before I launch into that, I can tell you who I am. I'm a guy that works at Canonical. Uh, I've worked on Canonical's container stack and uh, most recently also the kernel. Um, so anyway, back to containers. Um, the, the, the view that we've historically taken is that containers are uh, basically a cheaper virtual machine, exactly what he said not to think about. And um, the reason that I think it's interesting to think about it this way is because then you, could, you can do, you, today with all of the features in the kernel, you can actually do secure multi-tenancy with things like user namespaces and stuff like that. And so here's a little timeline that I made of, uh, of kind of the history of this. It wasn't, it wasn't always uh, the case that you could do secure multi-tenancy with containers with uh, the, the upstream kernel. And so there's some uh, text up here, and if you're like me, I couldn't read this in the background. So the highlights are basically, we worked on things for a long time, and in uh, 2014 there was a big project rework uh, to, in, to basically make a C library that you could call into to manipulate containers and things like that. Um, and that was sort of preparation for LexD, which is this thing uh, that Canonical is, is pushing today as the container uh, hypervisor or whatever. Um, but the, 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 the reality of LexD is that it's using this, libs, this C library that we built um, to manipulate the actual kernel primitives into giving you the, this, um, what is effectively a, a user space fiction built on top of these kernel uh, parameters, or kernel, these kernel uh, uh, things that you can use, the APIs that you can call to, to build different things like C groups and, and uh, namespaces and things like that. Um, and so we're rapidly working towards uh, Lex C and Lex D. We're going to start at 2.0, uh, just to be a little bit weird, because L LXC was sort of the 1.0 version of all this technology. Um, and just to clarify a little bit more of how we see LexD, since a lot of people have asked me this, um, LexD is effectively a building block. So it's basically, you can think of it as a REST API that um, looks exactly like some sort of uh, API that you might um, experience with VMware or something else where you can, you can ask it, hey, create me, a, create me a container. And then you get back, what you get back is a container that's, that's a secure multi-tenant container. And somebody else can ask the API, hey, create me a container. And those two containers can't interact with each other or bash into each other or whatever. Um, it's fast. And it's fast for the reasons that containers are fast, which is basically there's not two kernels when you have two containers. You're, you're sharing the same kernel. And so when you're trying to do context switching um, or the, the, the two uh, containers have very high load. The kernel can a lot more effectively manage that load because it's basically just switching between Linux processes. Um, and it's secure because we use uh, every uh, kernel security primitive that there is today. And we're also adding new ones, um, like C group namespaces will be in uh, the 4.6 kernel. Um, so here's, a, here's just another picture. So there's, uh, you know, the con container runtimes is defined uh, before t uh, beforehand in the talk. So these are things like Rocket and Docker. Um, and those are really, they have, you have some application metadata, some application and metadata, and you take that and you give it to the runtime and you say, uh, here you go, run this thing um, under these constraints. And below down here, you have these, these things where the, the, the core primitive is not a process or an application, but it's a system. So it's uh, give me a Windows, or give me a CentOS, or give me an Ubuntu. And so this is sort of where we see LexD fitting in is, is down at this level. Um, and so that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about, about just to sort of clarify what LexD is. Um, but the, the thing with LexD is since it's supposed to look like a hypervisor, you can do hypervisory things. One of the things that you can do 
is uh, you can take snapshots. So you can say, um, you know, take a snapshot of this container at this uh, current point, or you can say take a snapshot of this container with this point with its memory state as well. So if you have some database that has a cache that's now been warmed, you can snapshot it and then restore that warmed cache maybe on another host so you, can, you don't have to pre-warm the cache on two hosts. Uh, or you can do file injection and stuff like that. And all that's very simple. Again, you just do an HTTP post to some REST API call. So ultimately what this looks like is this picture here you have on the red on top is some, some client, whether it's, uh, it's Nova Compute LexD, which is the, the LexD OpenStack plugin. You have the, the command line tool that we maintain or some other client or script that you have. Um, and it talks to a REST API, which talks to the daemon, which then talks to uh, LXC, the, that library that we wrote, which then talks to the kernel to actually put all the namespaces and everything together. Um, and so, so this is sort of the full stack. Um, but if we go back to the hypervisory thing, so w one of the reasons to have a daemon is because um, you might want to do things like live migration. And so if you think about what that involves, you want to have a host over here and a host over here, and you want to take the memory state and all of the, in, if you think about what a container involves, it's all of these kernel primitives. So like mounts, mount namespaces, uh, T TCP sockets and TCP socket buffers, all the stuff inside the kernel that's actually been sent to the host yet, but the application hasn't received. All that stuff needs to be migrated. Um, so there's all of these little little details, all of the Linux security module state, LSM state, like app armor or um, uh, SE Linux or uh, Smack or whatever. Um, so, the, like all of these, all of these kernel features, Unix sockets, everything needs to be grabbed from this one host, sent across the wire, and restored on this other host. And of course, this process could fail in any number of ways. And so, the reason you have you want a daemon is so that you can have some negotiation on both sides to say, uh, hey, this this worked or it didn't. Um, maybe you should not stop this process on this host because I can't migrate this process or whatever. So that's the motivation for a daemon. Um, so when you, when, you, when you migrate something with our command line client, the, the headline here at the top is what you get. Just you, you do an LXC move, you move the container from one host to another. And what happens when you actually type that is that LexD negotiates three different channels. Uh, so it negotiates a control channel, which is basically just the, hey, this failed, or hey, this worked. It negotiates a, a, a file system channel. So LexD supports various file system backends, and it can do some smart things depending on what file system backends the two hosts have. And then, and then the final thing it negotiates is the container process state uh, channel, which is exactly this, uh, this channel for transferring the, you know, the mount namespaces and all of these little kernel details that you need to do. Um, and the way that it does that is it uses a tool called CREU uh, to, to take and check to, to grab all of that state out of the kernel, send it across the wire, and then push it all back in on the other side. Um, so a history of CREU. Uh, CREU has uh, actually been around for a long time, or at least the, the concept of this migration of containers in this way of sticking state back into the kernel as opposed to the KVM style just uh, the restoring the memory pages effectively. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with the uh, container uh, solution called OpenVZ, uh, what they basically had is like a 250,000 line kernel patch that implements a whole bunch of features on top of the mainline kernel. And one of them was this migration thing. And they did it all in the kernel. Um, and in 2000, they, I think this was released in 2005. Um, and then in 2006, they tried they started trying to upstream it. And they basically just sent the patch to the kernel guys and said, hey, here's a patch that does live migration. You know, it's however many lines it was, probably a lot. Uh, and he, the kernel guys uh, didn't like that very much. And so um, it didn't really go anywhere. Um, and so the, the OpenVZ guys are trying to get their delta from whatever it is, 250,000 lines down to zero, ultimately, so they can run on a mainline kernel. And they've been working on this process for the last 10 years, upstreaming various features, um, including some of the namespaces and things like that. Um, and so uh, another natural feature to want to upstream is the, this checkpoint restore feature. So in 2011, they kind of began discussing uh, 
um, how they would start working on this. And the idea was basically, well, there's slash proc and slash sys. And those actually have a, a, a lot of information about e each individual process. So um, you can get information about the memory maps and, and um, what open file descriptors there are. You can you know, manipulate the file descriptors by opening the proc self FD number and then doing whatever you want to that yourself, doing a send FD or something. Um, you can p-trace the process and inject code into its memory and, and poke around that way. So there's actually a lot of ways which from user space you can in, in, uh, inspect the process. And so the idea here was basically use all of the user space tools that we have today and maybe some kernel patches here and there if needed to inspect a process's state so that you can then go and so on some other host recreate that. And so um, in uh, 2000 and I, th I, I don't know, it's not clear from my timeline, I think it was January 2012 um, that the first uh, checkpoint restore specific patches were emerged. Um, and, th and those were, again, things like, uh, you know, you, you can't uh, inspect certain things in, in ptrace state unless you're the actual process and stuff like that. And so there's, there's been, a, I think, on an order of 200 to 250 of these uh, checkpoint restore specific kernel patches that have gotten the kernel so far. But for the, amount of, uh, for the amount of stuff that there is, just pure kernel features that you have to know how to checkpoint, it's kind of surprising that there, there was only that many needed. And of course, there's still more that are needed, but um, it, it hasn't been an overwhelming majority of the work that's gone into this. Um, so anyway, 2012, that was kind of, uh, that, that's, that work started. Um, there was an initial release of CRIU. Uh, another thing that's very interesting is, so you don't, when you, when you migrate, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna just stop the world and then send the whole contents of memory across the wire and then start the world again, because if, if your process that you're migrating is a database server and it has 20 gigabytes of memory, you end up sending 20 gigabytes over the wire and then you restore on the other side. So the, the dead time um, between stop and start is, is however long it takes you to transfer that 20 gigabytes. So what, one of the things that you might wanna do is do what's called an iter iterative migration. So send the 20 gigabytes over, but keep the thing running, but track which pages were modified and then only send the subset of pages that were modified and maybe that's five gigabytes and then maybe it's one gigabyte after that, and maybe it's 200 megs after that, and you say, okay, if it's less than 200 megs, then we'll just stop the world and send it, because that's small enough. So that, again, was a, a feature that needed some, uh, some tracking or some support upstream, and so those, those uh, patches were merged sometime in the middle of 2013. Um, then in, in, in 2014, uh, LXC got support for Checkpoint Restore, via CRIU, uh, and I demonstrated this at some conference with a fancy demo of Doom being live migrated. Um, and then in 2015, libcontainer got support, and there was a great demo with Quake being migrated. Uh, and so I think this year, uh, Virtuoso 7, which is the sort of modern version of OpenVZ, um, I, th they're, I think they're working very hard. I don't know if they'll get there, but they're working very hard on making CRIU the the live migration engine for Virtuoso 7, and so I hope that they'll do a half-life demo. Um, so the question is, uh, what's the catch here? This, this all sounds good. There's lots of kernel, kernel work going on. So here's a quote from Linus on the first set of patches. He says, a note on this, this project is by various mad Russians, uh, the OpenVZ team is all Russian, <laughs> Uh, to perform checkpoint restore mainly from user space with various oddball helper code added. And this oddball helper code is, are the 250 patches that I described. Various oddball helper code had added into the kernel where the need is demonstrator. However, I'm less confident than the, than the developers that this will all eventually work. Um, so it's all guarded by a flag now called config checkpoint restore and you can enable or disable it as you, as you want. But uh, Linus was a skeptic initially and probably still is. Um, so another, another skeptic is a guy named Leonard Pottering who happens to be the maintainer of systemd. Uh, he said, this is not an enterprise feature. It's a promise that we cannot keep. We will not add code to systemd that works often but not always and CRIU is exactly of that kind. Uh, so this is from a mailing list post uh, in April of last year. And it turns out that he's actually right. Um, it won't always work. And, and the, the reality is that 
this checkpoint restore tool, as cool as it is to see Doom freeze and, and, and go, it, it won't always work. Um, because we'll always be playing catch up. There will always be kernel features. I don't know if, if, if you guys have ever used debugfs. Anybody have ever used that? Um, so it's a, I forget which way it was. I think it was tracefs. I, I think debugfs is the new one and tracefs is the old one. But anyway, basically what happened was in, in 2015, somebody added this thing where if you mount a tracefs, you automatic, automatically get a debugfs for free. But that means that some, uh, Kriu developer needs to sit down, look through debugfs and see, does this, does this thing have any state? Does it have any state that I need to figure out how to extract from the kernel so that I can put it back in on the other side so it behaves correctly? Um, if, if no, then I can whitelist it and say we can just dump and restore this, but otherwise I'm going to have to figure out how to add a kernel API. Um, but, but the reality is that even if, if we start requiring, if we make it a law that any new kernel change that adds some state needs to have an API that uh, some project can checkpoint and restore it, we still have somebody has to sit down and write the user space side of that. So even if in the best case scenario, which I don't think will be in the best case, but in the best case scenario, we would, we, would, we, get, we would get this API guarantee that there would always be a checkpoint restore API. And even in that case, we'll still be playing catch up. So uh, I think Leonard is right when he says, it will work often, but not always. And, and the problem here is that it will work for the kernel features that it's been implemented for, but not others. So if you notice all these video game demos, there's no support for sound. And the reason for that is because sound is a, you know, it's another device type that nobody's bothered to implement checkpoint restore for. And the reality is it will probably never exist because no enterprise organization who's doing cloud stuff cares about sound cards. You know, it's not a useful thing to live migrate. So, um, so there's certain things that will probably just never be supported, but the reality is that that maybe doesn't matter. You know, again, for, uh, for cloud organizations, if you can't migrate sound, who cares? Um, so th there, th this issue of uh, sound is interesting, though, because uh, enterprises may want to use uh, some custom devices that are, that are exposed in slash dev in some way. So you can imagine uh, some fancy, even fancier than InfiniBand networking card or you know, some graphics device or some crypto processing chip or something. Um, and so the, the, the goal here is uh, Kriu has what, it's like a plug-in mechanism. So basically if during the checkpoint process it comes across some something, some device that your process or your container has opened, but it doesn't know how to checkpoint or restore, it can hand that off to a plugin, which then may know how to access that device's state. And so then all that needs to happen is on restore, you know, if you're gonna migrate from a host with one of these fancy crypto chips to another host, this other host then also has to have that fancy crypto chip and it has to have this API to restore into, into so that it'll, it'll work on both sides. But there, there is, there is a conceivably a way to do this. Um, so here's just uh, another, there's, there's a million other kernel features. Feel free to ask me later. Um, but uh, there's lots of kernel features that won't ever work, but we're adding, we're adding more. Um, and uh, in particular, these demos that you saw, they're, they're, they're not, they don't have sound and they don't have uh, some other things, but one, one of the most important ones is the security primitives. So we, we talked about LexD is very secure because it uses every available security primitive. But the reality was up until about six months ago, uh, we didn't live migrate security primitives. So if you had a, something that was confined by AppArmor and SecComp and you live migrated it to another host, it just wasn't anymore. So the, that's the sleep at the wheel here. Um, uh, but we've since fixed that. Um, so there, here's a kind of a list of all the security primitives uh, in the kernel. Um, so that we have C groups, then I have the LSMs here on the, the second line. Um, then I have SecComp. SecComp has two modes, a strict mode and a filter mode. We support both of those. We also support containers that are uh, user namespace. And the user namespace one is kind of interesting because as soon as you enter into a user namespace, there's a lot of things that you can't do anymore. So for example, um, if you enter into a user namespace, you can no longer install Berkeley packet filters because the Berkeley packet filter parser is not root, uh, not non-root safe, meaning they haven't checked it all for all sorts of kernel exploits. And so 
um, root has to install the Berkeley packet filters or seccom filters is another one. Um, but the problem is that so, so if we say seccom filters uh, the problem is that you if you install a seccom filter before you enter your user namespace uh, the seccom filter might actually block the user namespace call. So then your your live migration process will get killed instantly. So you want to do this user namespaces after the seccom stuff but then you want to do the seccom stuff after the user namespaces stuff. And it turns out there's a lot of stuff like this where the, it all is very restrictive and has to go last. And so you have to do a lot of fancy tap dancing in order to get that all to work. But the, the good news is that um, we've managed to do a lot of the fancy tap dancing and make that work. Except notably uh, SE Linux. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the, when I implemented the Linux security module migration stuff, I had uh, initially I had it patched in so that SE Linux would work. Um, but then the, the maintainer, who is a Russian guy named Pavel Emilianov, asked me, uh, he said, so do you understand how SE Linux works? And I said, no. I said, I just kind of did this because it, it mostly works and I thought it would be cool. And he said, well, can we disable it until somebody comes along who understands how to do it and uh, somebody who actually understands SE Linux? And so to date, uh, that was about a year ago or a, l uh, a little under, and to date nobody has come along. So if you understand SE Linux and you're interested in live migration, there's a job for you. Um, so another thing, uh, <laughs> this feature gives me the creeps. So this, was this, this is the seccomp maintainer. So when I was doing the work to uh, do the, the kernel side of the, the dumping for um, uh, seccomp filters part of the problem is that for because other kernel maintainers have told us that we can't do certain things one of the things that Creu needs to do is inject code into the process's address space and run that code the problem is when you inject that code if that code has a blocked system call by a seccomp filter that's currently on that process then the, that whole process will die and you won't be able to dump it so instead what you do is you have a way to remotely disable seccomp on that process which is the feature that give, gave case cook the, the creeps. So there, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, pe people are uh, creeped out I guess maybe by, by this checkpoint restore stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, my, my claim here is that we've done a lot of work in the last year or so to make this mostly correct. There's still a lot of work ongoing. Um, in particular, mounts is a very confusing area. So if you know a lot about R shared and slave mounts and all, all that good stuff, uh, come talk to me because we'd love input on that. Um, but so, so suppose that we're mostly correct. We also need to solve the fast problem. And um, so far, we haven't done a lot of work on that, although I'm hopeful this year we'll, we'll start doing that. Um, so uh, earlier I mentioned three channels. There's the control channel that when, when, when you live migrate something, there's a control channel. So when um, LexD starts up a migration, that's the thing that it, it says, yes, this will work or no, it won't. The second one is a file system specific channel. Um, and the interesting thing about this is if you have a, have a good file system where good is equal to, you know, ZFS or ButterFS if you're so inclined or whatever, um, these file systems have native transfer, transfer mechanisms that are much faster than just a simple rsync of a X4 across a wire. So you can do a ZFS send and it will do some fancy stuff and um, compress and send all the inodes or I don't know what it does actually. It's some, some sort of magic. Um, and that is, is, is significantly faster than R syncing and trying to hash everything and, and who knows what. Um, and so, so uh, LexD is smart enough to realize, oh hey, you're using ZFS, why don't we use this smarter transfer mechanism? Um, so that's one of the ways that we're trying to, to speed this transfer up is by using, you know, underlying primitives that are faster than whatever we know as, know how to do as a dumb rsync. But then of course we can also rc if you have one uh, host that's a ZFS host, another host that's an LVM host, then we'll rsync, we'll fall back to rsync across from those. So the memory state, uh, I mentioned before um, that uh, we're, currently doing a stop the world style migration and, and both of the, the, the doom and quake migrations were the stop the world kind with a little bit of smoke and mirrors. 
Um, some of the smoke and mirrors was, in both cases, we had the file system pre-synced. So you only had to sync a very small delta. If you think about a game, um, most of the changes are actually in memory. The, the sprites and stuff, actually all the big data on the file system doesn't change at all. And so the file system sync, even though it was an R sync, was very fast because there was no, there was no actual data that needed to be transferred. Um, so uh, you, had, you had that, um, but it was still a stop the world memory transfer. We'd like to, to do some work on that. Um, there's a tool called PHAL, which is, uh, stands for Process Hauler, um, that the OpenVZ guys have been uh, championing as a way to do this. Um, right now, it's just a bunch of commits in a repo. I don't think it's ever had a real release, but I think uh, the, the migration community is interested in focusing on that. Uh, here f over the next the course of the next year to, ch to try and make this faster. Um, so just a little administrivia about things. Uh, we're current, currently at 2.0.0 beta 1 for LexD. Uh, 2.0 is target targeted for February, which is now this month, which is scary. Um, LexD and uh, LexC, the 2.0s will land in Xenial, which is the next uh, long-term support release for uh, Ubuntu. Um, as will CG, CGNS, so uh, one of the guys on our team has done this C group namespaces patch, um, and that simplifies a lot of things. I don't know if you've ever played with C groups today, but basically you invent your own namespace by sectioning off. We have like a slash LXC slash container name, and then we put the container under there, and it's just kind of a big hack. And the real way, to, the right way to do this is with C group namespaces. So. That um, initially went into, uh, I think, the 4.4 C group tree and then was pulled out for a couple of reasons. And so now it's the, the 4.5 merge window is closed. So I think it will go into 4.6 uh, for the upstream kernel, but uh, I, our kernel team will be backporting C group namespaces to 4.4. So it will be in the, the Xenial kernel. Um, there's some URLs uh, to our stuff. Uh, Kriu, the their current stable release is 1.8, which I think was released on December 7th. They have a three re month release case cadence, so I think the next one will be 1.9 on March 7th, although they're expecting a big rearrange for the 2.0 release, and we talked a little bit about what that's going to mean, but we haven't made any decisions yet. So at this point, this is what I know how to tell you about how that's going to be released. But both of these projects, as well as the kernel, I mean, if, if you're not running a 4.4 kernel, you can't use all available features. So there's all, I would say all three of these projects are under very active development in terms of kernel, user space features, and then, uh, you know, just like improvements in the API and the user experience of LexD as well. Um, so. That's it. I think I'm a little short. So if anybody has any questions about containers or migration or goofy kernel stuff or tacos, I like tacos. No questions? Yes. So uh, the question is, this, for CRIU, CRIU, how easy is it to, uh, to use CRIU without that? And I think the answer is, it's not very easy. Um, so the, the approach CRIU has taken with uh, new features is that they, they don't enable them by default. And so what that ends up meaning is that when you, when you want to migrate a container that uh, supports everything that CRIU supports, you have to pass in all of these ver various flags in order to enable all of the stuff. And then there's also stuff like if you, say for example, are running uh, some C group file system and you want to bind mount part of that into your container, or maybe you have a network shared file system that's bind mounted into the container, CRIU doesn't know how to navigate the fact that that one part of that bind mount is inside the mount namespace and the other part is outside. So you have to pass it a flag to tell it that. Uh, another problem is that if the container's init died, it's highly likely that the container runtime, whether it's Rocket or Docker or LXC, will flip out and say like, oh my god, the, the container init died. Something really bad happened. Um, but the reality is, no, you just told CRIU to checkpoint it. And and you didn't you didn't tell it to leave it running, and so then it then it killed it. So you, you I think there's some you need some you need some way to work with the container runtime, 
And, uh, and the reality is it's pretty complicated to use outside of that. So um, I think it's easiest to do that, I guess is my, is my answer, is it's not, su not super easy if you're not closely following it, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so your question is, are there other users of CRIU besides LXC, LXD? Yeah, so, um, so there's a lib container support right now. And like I say, the, the Parallels folks are rapidly moving OpenVZ towards it. So, I mean, as, as far as I understand it, the container community, the, at least the guys maintaining runtimes, have all consolidated on CRIU as the way to uh, maintain, the way to migrate containers. So, other questions? Yes? Good question. So the question is, um, what needs to stay the same between uh, two hosts when you're migrating between them, whether it's hardware or software, software being kernel versions? So there's the, the, to answer the, the first question, um, which is, does the hardware need to be the same? Uh, kind of. If your application does some detection of, hey, uh, we have some, you know, uh, SSE extension that, you know, AMD doesn't implement, and we're going to do some JIT compiling on that. And then you have this generated assembly in memory that uses this instruction set. And then you try and move it over to an AMD chip that doesn't support that. You're going to get an undefined instruction problem or error. So um, it, it depends on your application. And unfortunately, there's no way to know, did, does your application run a JIT compiler? Basically, what happens is you migrate it, and then it just screws up at the, on the other side, which is, which is not ideal. Um, the, the, for the kernel question, I can give you a little bit better answer, which is if you believe Linus, then we're okay. So Linus gets very pissed off when people uh, break the ABI. And so if you're migrating from an older kernel to a newer kernel, the ABI should be stable. And so we should be able to extract and put back in the, uh, the kernel state with no problems because the ABI stability is guaranteed. Uh, of course, if you're going from a newer kernel to an older kernel, if this newer kernel has features that the older kernel didn't, there's no way to put those features back into this kernel. However, CRIU has been, again, although you have to pass it this myriad of options, that also means that there's a myriad of options to say, hey, it's okay if you don't have this feature. You know, here's some incantation that, that you, you can do that, but you have to know what you're doing. So um, the kernel case, I think, is, is actually a, a good, you know, it's basically as good as it could get. Uh, the, the hardware case is a little bit more challenging, and I'm not, I don't know that there's a good answer to that problem, but other questions? Yes? Oh, sorry. You, on the checkpoint side, you mentioned you're trying to do as much as you can in user space. How do you actually achieve the uh, restore? Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, I mean, you're obviously not doing a simple exec or anything like that. Right. Yeah. So this is, it's, it's very gory, actually. Um, so if you think about, like, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to have the right process tree. So the first thing Cryu does is it forks in all the right ways, and it creates the, the process tree. And then it goes about setting up basically as much kernel, as many kernel resources as it can without um, screwing up the memory state. And then it unmaps its own libc. And it maps its, itself into this blob over here that doesn't interact with any of the other memory that the process had. And then it jumps to this blob, which subsequently you know, remaps this memory in all the right places and sets up all the, the remaining things, like the things you want to do at the end, like the set comp stuff, because if set comp blocks uh, mem map, then you know, you'll die. It, it'll, your process, your task will get killed. So you, you remap all this memory, but, but with no libc. You know, you, you've unmapped your libc at this point. So you remap all this memory, and then you, uh, and then you restore all this stuff at the end, credentials, so it does a set UID at the end, all that kind of stuff. And then it does a sig return, and the, so the, the parent CRIU process has p-traced all of these things, and it makes them all wait at a SIG return. And then all of a sudden, it does a piece trace dechatch, and everything goes. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit hairy, but it's, um, 
it works very nicely, nicely, surprisingly. Does that answer your question? Somebody else had a question? Yes. Right, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, how can it, can it tell me if it's gonna screw up? And more importantly, when, when it's gonna screw up, can it leave my old stuff intact? And the answer to this, the, those is kind of similar. If it can tell you that it's gonna screw up, it will leave your stuff intact. They've been, the um, CRIU code has been very good about bailing reasonably and detaching and leaving everything in the same state. However, there are a few cases. There's this one about the, the CPU architecture. There's another one about uh, VDSO. So this is, um, it's an optimization, it's, it stands for virtualized digital shared ob something, shared object, I forget. But the, the idea is that you take some kernel code and you push, map it in user space somewhere so you don't have to keep going into the kernel again. And so there's, a, there's a, some weirdness about this that I don't quite exactly understand, but Cree also cannot totally detect when that's gonna go wrong. Um, and we know how to, f well, uh, someone knows how to fix it. Uh, and so hopefully we'll fix it soon. But the, I think the reality is that um, that doesn't happen very often. And uh, so you, it's basically a random thing and you have to get extremely unlucky for it to happen, but it is a problem. So there's two cases that I know of where uh, it, it may not work. Um, one of them is fixable. The other one, you know, if you know that your workload doesn't have a JIT compiler, then you're done. Um, you just have to know a little bit about your workload. So I think, that, I think the reality of this migration stuff is that you're gonna have to understand your workload to know whether it's gonna work for you. Um, so the, the one you can eliminate with the workload thing, the other one is, is basically just a bug in CRIU that needs to be fixed. Um, but those are the only two that I'm aware of today where it wouldn't tell you and it would just continue on merrily until it blew up on the other side. But in every other case, it should tell you, I don't know what to do with this. Good luck. So. Other questions? Yes. So generally, how long does it take to migrate a medium-sized component? Uh, so the question is generally how long does it take to migrate a what, whatever a medium-sized container is? Um, so the Doom, the Doom demos, you know, stuff like that. So those containers, the, they're going to allocate you know, 200 megs of memory or something for all the textures. Uh, and, and the, you know, the file system rsync is in there, but like I say, that was mostly smoke and mirrors, I think is about three seconds. And so there's some, you know, some time spent in rsync and memory transfer, but I think about a half a second of that is the actual forking and mapping and unmapping and all that that happens. Um, so there's some, you know, there's some bottleneck there about the restore is just always going to take some time. But I, as far as I'm aware, it's not a super significant fraction. In fact, the, the funniest one that I know of is that um, because uh, Cree looks in slash proc a lot for lots of different things, it spends a lot of time opening files. And when, for a long time at least, I don't know if it's still the case, but if you, if you invoke open in certain ways, glibc tries to read 4K and cache that file. And it turns out that that just kills your performance. So Cree has its own re-implementation of the open, which basically of open, which basically just calls this call directly because this was a huge bottleneck. So there's there's little things like this which you can profile and clean up so that it will go faster. But I think I think the reality is that most of the time is going to be spent in the transfer, and so the, the optimization here is to think very carefully about if you have lots of memory or whatever, how do you do that effectively? So. Far side, yep. So the question is, can you choose to migrate certain processes or do you migrate everything? So uh, you, migrate, you migrate everything in the container. Um, so basically, the way Cree works, you just give it a, a process ID, and then every, everything that's a child of that process ID gets migrated. And so um, 
for container engines, the natural you know option is just to give it that containers init process ID. But if you were going to do it yourself by hand and you were willing to do all this work to pass all these options, then uh, you could you could migrate something that wasn't the init process ID. You could just say just migrate MySQL and all of its children. Um, but again, I think the natural choice for the container engines is just to start at init and migrate everything down. And so that's what they do. Yep. Uh, so I don't. I, so the question is, if you're able to do individual applications, can you can you apply uh, updates to shared libraries? Uh, and I think the answer is no, um, because the way Cree works, it 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 saves the actual memory the the memory map of of the process. So if you think about when when I load a shared object, I basically m map that shared object and. So if the underlying representation on changes on disk and the symbols are in different places, that M map, maybe I'll M map the object, but the symbols will be off. And so then when I, the, when I try and jump, it'll jump to the wrong place. So unfortunately, I think that won't work. The int there is an interesting application for kernel upgrades. Because you, can, because you can advance kernel upgrades, you could checkpoint everything, save that into a uh, RAMFS, k-exec, restore from that. Since it was all in RAM, it should be very fast, and you didn't have to transfer anything because you know because the disks are all still attached and whatnot. So, I think there is an application there that's very interesting that people have been looking at. So, but uh, yeah, I think unfortunately, not shared libraries. Other questions? Yes. Uh, there is a guy who's using it in production. Uh, let's see if I can remember. It's a. It's a Node.js, um, I can't remember the name. The guy's name is Ross, uh, what's the guy's name? Ross Boucher. And it's, so he's using, uh, he's using it in Node.js to do, you can go backwards. So you, you, he has some uh, like JavaScript terminal and you can go to his web page and type stuff in. And it's like a reverse debugger. And the way he's doing that is he, he checkpoints at every step and then he restores. And so that's a production web service that people pay him for. He's the only one that I know of today that's recommending use in production. Or I guess he's, his users don't know that they're using it, but they are. Um, we, I think today, right now, this is sort of just a, hey, this is really, really cool. You should play with it. But I don't think we're recommending its use in production yet. Maybe, maybe next year. But um, yes. So the question is, uh, what's the networking side of this? Um, so uh, the, the beauty of this actually is that that all essentially comes for free thanks to the VM migration guys. <clears throat> so um, basically, the, the kernel, when it sees a new MAC address, it does an ARP broadcast for you. And the switches are all smart enough to understand that, hey, this MAC address moved from here to here. And so if you have a TCP connection, the Cree dumps the TCP buffer and then restores it on this side, and, the, and it restores the MAC address as well for the VEth or whatever the networking type is. And uh, the kernel does this ARP broadcast, and, and the switch starts routing that MAC's traffic over here. So as long as you as long as you migrate and it finishes within the TCP timeout window, it should just start up again, sort of magically. So, does that answer your question? Other questions? Going once, twice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that.